curious, uh, how many of you have had a run-in with ticks so far this year? Is there anything in particular that you guys want to know about from this point on? Mostly, I'm, I'm going to go over basically biology. I'm going to go over a little bit about the diseases that are here in Plymouth County and also a lot of the protection methods. And so we'll focus on personal protection, yard protection, pet protection, and because we think that those are the three avenues that people become exposed to ticks. They pick them up themselves, they either encounter them in the yard when they're not protecting themselves, or their pets bring them into their house when they're unaware of that there may be ticks around. Um, but if there's anything else that people want to know more about. And, and once you've been bitten by a tick, what are the, the symptoms? You know, what should you be looking for as far as being sick or? So the symptoms for a lot of the tick-borne diseases, they tend to mimic more of the flu-like symptoms. So headache, nausea, sometimes memory loss, sometimes night sweats. But they vary depending on the person, the severity of the infection. They can vary. It's like babesiosis, for instance, you tend to get more night sweats. And then for Lyme, you can get migrating joint pain. Uh, and so they're, they're, they can, but you don't necessarily always get those. So you could have babesiosis or Lyme and only get headache and nausea. So uh, you know, you can't really diagnose yourself with that. But if you start feeling like you might have the flu in the summer, summer flu is usually like one of the things, like if you have a tick bite and then now you feel like you have flu in the summer, then that would be a good indication to see your primary care provider and see if they can diagnose you with something or give you some treatment on that. Would it affect your ears as well, like an ear infection? Like an ear infection? Um, I don't know. I, I know with, at least with Lyme, like I said, there can be migrating joint pain and migrating pain in different areas. I can't say it's impossible that it wouldn't affect your ears. It doesn't seem as likely. It's usually like your, it's usually like your major joints, like finger, knuckles, and knees. But it's possible. It's certainly po I don't know. I'm not a doctor, so. Hey, you ready to go? Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. Great. We already started, I guess. <laughs> I was just, well, he asked if there's anything in particular. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Are we all set? Covered. All set. Just... No. Thumbs up uh, on you guys? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Already, right. Okay, great. Well, so, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Tech Talk. We're so pleased to have our expert uh, here to teach us everything we wanted to know and then some about ticks. So I uh, just want to thank a couple of folks. Uh, first off, I'm, I'm Josh, representative Josh Cutler. I think I, I think I know everyone in the room. If not, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Senator Mike Brady and I are co-hosting this event. And afterwards, we have a free lunch coming uh, that we are treating everyone to from uh, the old hitching post. So uh, Senator Brady wasn't able to be here himself. But uh, he is helping the co-host and spring for lunch, so we want to thank Senator Brady mm -hmm. for doing that. Thank all of you for coming. And we want to thank Plymouth County, uh, which is uh, uh, Blake's uh, employer, for uh, having, for, first of all, for hiring him and caring <laughs> enough about this important issue to, to dedicate the resources to that. Unfortunately, here in Plymouth County, we have one of the highest incidents of Lyme disease, I think, in the nation. I'm sure Blake's going to tell us more about yeah. that. And so it's a serious concern, tick-borne illness, tick-borne disease. Um, this is a significant issue for us, and so we're so pleased that we can have Blake here to, to tell us and kind of dispel some of the myths, educate us, tell us the facts, and how we can better prevent um, these kinds of illnesses. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Blake Dinius, who is the Plymouth County entomologist. His biology background is an expert in bugs. He's a bug guy, an insect guy, who's going to walk through a presentation, and I'm sure, sure he's happy to take some questions. Okay? Right. So welcome, Blake. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Josh. All right, welcome everyone. Um, did you have a question over here? Yeah, how come the Plymouth County is higher than the like rest? At the beginning of the early spring, go around and spray everything. So that's different. That, that's Plymouth County Mosquito Control, and they do their own thing. If you have any questions about the way that people control mosquitoes, I would definitely recommend that you contact either Ellen Bidleck. She's the entomologist for Plymouth County Mosquito Control. You can, there's a number you can dial, and they'll tell you all about it. Uh, I like Ellen a lot. She's a great person, really easy to interact with, and she'll be able to explain everything. So but that wouldn't help ticks if they did that? It's different. They're gonna. They usually spray in different areas. They have a different method of spraying and treating. And so it's the same idea. Like when people treat their lawn for grubs, it's a different. It's the same similar compound, but they're doing it in different areas. So your grub treatments aren't really gonna infect mosquitoes and ticks. 
Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah. yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to get through. If we could please save any of the stories or questions till afterward, that'd be great. The lights yeah, yeah, um, yeah, right here. So I did this last time. Yeah, there we go. All right. So uh, when I got into this. Uh, as Josh mentioned, my background's in, in science, so I've got seven years of insect research under, under my belt. I've probably run about 200 studies in my lifetime. And when I got into this, I had a lot of people telling me what to do and what to say. And I said to myself, if I'm going to put my name on this, it has to be stuff, it has to be information that I've personally vetted out myself. And so if you have any questions regarding any of the things that come up, maybe they don't jive with some of the stuff that you might have read online or seen in the newspaper, I'm really happy to entertain any questions on that. There's also a lot of information on ticks more than we could cover in this very short period of time we have together. So if you have any questions, you can also email me uh, if we don't get to it in this presentation as well. But one of the things that really came up that's really interesting is this concept of fake news. And we hear about this all the time now, but this isn't a new thing. If you've been in science for, for a, a while, if you've been in science pretty much all, like for, since science began, this concept of fake news has always really existed where they, they've taken a study, they say a study says X, and it's not necessarily, it doesn't mean that that study proves this. And what, there, was this per, there was this incident of fake news that came out last year, right around this time, and the CDC was talking about how tick and mosquito-borne diseases have increased three times in in the past, uh, since 2004, in the past 15 years. And this didn't quite jive with me. And again, th this is kind of one of those things where we're going to go in and talk a little bit about what fake news is. Because there's a lot of misinformation spread about ticks, and there's also a lot of fear that kind of gets spread around about ticks. But if you have the right tools, and you understand what's going on, then there, the, 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 weir the worry and the fear regarding tick-borne diseases, it doesn't have to exist. Uh, I'm someone, and I go outside all the time, and I walk through the woods, and I don't lock myself inside my house, and I've never gotten a tick-borne disease in my entire life. But anyways, going back to this study, so this was released by the CDC, and they said that there was the disease that had tripled from 2004 to 2016, and you don't have to worry about the text here, but just look at the bars. If you look at the bars, this light gray bar here, that's, that's a about 42,000 cases of Zika. So this was the first year that Zika was reported. And these, these cases occurred mostly, primarily, in US territories like Puerto Rico and the US of Virgin Islands. So if you pull out those cases, all of those cases, what you find is that mosquito-borne diseases haven't really tripled at all. They've remain, remained relatively stable. And if you follow this data out into the next year, you'll find that this bar, this black line that I've drawn, stays exactly at the same level. It, the the mosquito-borne diseases have not really tripled in the, since 2004, even though the, you may be hearing about this. So they, I bring this up because, once again, it's not something that we should be afraid to go outside and afraid to do things. But what you see here is that tick Tick-borne diseases make up the bulk of all vector-borne diseases. So it's not mosquitoes that we're really concerned about. It's the fact that we're, we need to worry a little bit more about tick-borne diseases. So there's about 30,000 cases of Lyme that occur each year in the United States. Now, how many people in this room know someone who's had a case of Lyme? Do you, do you guys honestly think that it's just 30,000 cases, especially when we have 325 million people in the United States. Seems horrifically low, like a gross underestimation. And, uh, and people have brought this up. It's 0.009% of the entire US population. Now, just here in this room, we know that it's more than 0.009% of the population in this room. You know, pe pretty much everyone gets it. Their kids get it. Even people's dogs are getting this. Um, and the CDC looked into this, and they even admitted hey, maybe the criteria we use to determine whether or not there's a case of Lyme is underestimating the number of cases. They've admitted that. Because a case of Lyme is not a black and white situation. You think that it would be, but it's not. It's based on these rigid set of criteria. And maybe they're not capturing all the different cases. So if you went to your doctor, for instance, experiencing maybe flu-like symptoms, you were bit by a deer tick, and that doctor gave you a prescription, and sent you on your way, that would not constitute a case of Lyme. Even when that doctor is like, you have a case of Lyme. They, they need to run the blood test, or they need, there needs to be a rash. There needs to be a few different things that, that play into this. But the CDC guessed, took another guess. They took another guess at this, and they said, maybe the number of cases is 300,000 cases of Lyme per year. 
But if you ask researchers and scientists that have been working with this issue for a very long time, they'll even tell you, hey, look, maybe this is just another low estimate. We don't actually know. It could be higher than this. Maybe it could be a million cases. We have no idea. But no matter how you slice it, 30,000, 300,000, a million, those cases of Lyme are concentrated in two really important areas, here in the Northeast and in the Upper Midwest. And what we see from 2001 to 2015 is that they have radiated slightly outward, but they remain relatively focused in these two areas. And a lot of people freak out when they see this, but what I like to tell people is, over here, when you, you might not have as many cases of Lyme, but you've got earthquakes, right? And then here, you might not have as many cases of Lyme, but you've got tornadoes, right? At least here in these two areas, we have a fully preventable set of uh, issue. It's something that we can go outside. Here, you can't prevent earthquakes, you can prevent tornadoes. You can just brace yourself and hope for the best. Here, you can, you can do a set of actions and fully prevent this whole thing. If everyone, if everyone in these states listened to me, these numbers would look a lot more like these numbers over here. That's how preventable it is. So we know a lot about Lyme disease. Lyme is still the number one tick-borne disease. It's the most common. It causes a lot of the issues that we see with tick-borne diseases. It's not caused by too many coronas, or I certainly would have gotten it by now, uh, especially back in college. If any of you guys have ever been to college, these things, they're all over the place, even if you don't like them. And I, I'm more of a stout guy myself, but uh, I drank my fair share in college. Uh, it's, so it's not, we know it's not a government conspiracy. A lot of times people bring this up. Well, the, the, it was out of this biological lab on Plum Island and deer swam across the ocean and it radiated outward. We know it's not that. The, the Lyme bacteria, and it is a, a spirochete bacteria, has existed for what we think is about 60,000 years. At least 20,000 years, this, this disease has existed here in New England and these ticks, the black-legged tick, have been spreading it around since then. So this, is, this disease is an ancient disease. It's been around for a very, very long time. We know that it's also highly, highly dependent on the black-legged tick. There, there's no other tick here in New England that can transmit Lyme disease. And so without this tick, and we've seen in studies where they eradicate this tick, you eradicate Lyme disease. But there's still a lot of questions about this particular disease. For instance, is it completely curable? How many strains are there? Now we've got Lyme disease here in New England where it's either Borrelia burgdorferi or Borrelia mayoni, but over in Europe they have Borrelia afzelii and they have, uh, and then in Asia they have their own set of Borrelia as well. And so they're called Lyme disease in different parts of the world, yet there's different species that are causing this. And they have different symptoms too. The other question is, does it cause permanent damage? We don't know that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that they either called chronic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme. And we don't know if, uh, going on with this first one, we don't know what exactly is going on. We don't know if it's that Lyme has caused some permanent damage or that the Lyme bacteria is still in their body. We have no idea. Once again, it's very, very challenging to determine what is a case of Lyme. And without that ability to determine that, how do we know, why are these people experiencing symptoms after they've gotten their treatment? We're not sure. But wait, there's even more. <laughs> so it's not just Lyme. There's more, there's more diseases than just Lyme. There's actually nine other tick-borne diseases that you can get here in Massachusetts. And if you travel to other places in the United States, what you'll find is that they have their own set of diseases too. And then dogs and cats have their own set of diseases. So it's, it's not, even though we talk about Lyme, some people say Lyme. Well, it's also babesiosis and anaplasmosis. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there are many, many more. And these are much more rare. They're much more uncommon. But they st you can still get these here. And we see this based on uh, tick testing. And also, people have been diagnosed with this. On the Cape, for instance, they were had a few cases of Poisson virus in the past couple years. Uh, and, but the bottom line is that it's, it's counting. So it doesn't just stop at 10, that there may be more diseases out there. Ticks are actually very, very dirty creatures. And they pick up a lot of different pathogens, more than we may even know. And so this whole concept, like I said, of chronic Lyme may actually be another tick-borne disease. We don't know yet. I want to talk a little bit about one of these diseases called alpha-gal allergy. And this is one that's a little bit more rare, but I like to highlight this one because this is one of the diseases that crops up in the newspaper frequently. And I want to talk about what it is and how you might get it. So alpha-gal 
is not a feminist superhero, despite the name Alpha Gal. It's actually the allergy. A lot of times people talk about the allergy to red meat. And that's what this is. And this is relevant for this time of year where people are grilling up steak, grilling up burgers. Uh, but it hits more than just red meat. It's going to hit pretty much any product made from mammals. So gummy bears are included because they contain gelatin. Or even ice cream, where it's a dairy product, comes from mammals. But this, this tick-borne disease only comes what we believe from Lone Star Tick. And Lone Star Tick is, it was historically a southern species that has crept up. And now we find it all over Nantucket, all over Martha's Vineyard, all over the Cape. We even find it up as far north as Maine. So we do see certain, we do see some people have been bit in, uh, in Plymouth County by this tick, but we haven't seen an established population of this Lone Star Tick yet here in Plymouth County. But yeah, no one wants to end up like this, right? No one wants to end up kind of relegated to just eating vegetables. I want to talk a little bit about this other tick. This is called the longhorn tick. And this is another tick that you may have heard of in the newspapers. Uh, a lot of, it's been getting a lot of press and a lot of attention. This tick was first discovered in Hunterdon County, New Jersey in 2017. But we think it's been here since 2010. So this tick. This tick can reproduce asexually, and I like to think of them as strong, independent women that don't need no man. But the thing about this particular tick is that it takes a generation, the generation time is still about one year. So while you may hear about this tick being able to spread rapidly and end up in all these different counties and all these different states, like I said, we think it's been here since 2010. So it's been here for about seven years, reproducing constantly, being spread around. And even if it, you did get one tick here in your backyard, it still would take a whole year for this tick to kind of explode. So don't freak out about this tick kind of rapidly capitalizing your yard. The point is to be aware of this, not to be afraid. But this tick is cold tolerant. So we'll, they've run some computer simulations on where they predict this tick might end up. And in these two particular studies that were done in 2018, you're seeing this all the way up in Canada. So, you know, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. And so whether or not it hits Massachusetts is not really a question. It's not really a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And this is, you know, this is where the tick, the X's are where the tick has been found so far. So we think that it might be coming up along maybe the I-95 corridor. We think that it might be coming up maybe on deer, because this particular tick really likes large mammals. It doesn't particular, it will bite humans, but it doesn't really like humans. It likes these large animals, dogs, uh, alpaca, horses, sheep. The good news about this tick, there's some good, in, there's some actually kind of a silver lining when it comes to this tick. First off, in the 100 ticks that have been tested, not one of these ticks has been carrying any tick-borne diseases. So while this tick is still something to be aware of, like I said, that we haven't seen it transmit tick-borne disease yet. And in areas where we see this tick, we've actually seen fewer black-legged ticks, fewer deer ticks in that area. So this tick might actually have some impact on those areas in terms of tick-borne disease as well. So we don't know. There's still a lot of unknown stuff. We're still learning a lot about this tick. But it's a very interesting topic. And it, uh, I wanted you guys to know a little bit more about this going forward. So what's causing this? There's a lot of questions about, you know, why are there more ticks? Why are there more diseases? You know, when I was in college, you know, we really only had what we called the wood tick or American dog tick. And we didn't, you know, Lyme disease wasn't all those things that was just talk, it was almost like whispered, but no one really had it. And now after college and after my experience at my job, I feel like all we hear about is Lyme disease and tick-borne disease. And so why the increase? What's going on? Well, we think that there's a bunch of different factors. It's a complicated issue. We think there are many things at play here. Uh, one of the things that we think is impacting this is that doctors may be becoming more aware of the tick-borne diseases in the area. Lyme, when it was first that when it was first discovered, used to be called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, or in some of these diseases it might be called idiopathic diseases, where they're just not given a name. So when you come to recognize a disease, or if you have better diagnostic techniques, well, the number of cases will increase for that particular disease. So we think that. The fact that doctors are becoming more aware or there might be better practices, we think that that might be part of the reason why you see this upward trend in tick-borne diseases. But we also think that the risk is higher. We think that there are more ticks now than there used to be. And we think that these ticks are carrying more infection more often. We think that the infection rates are increasing over, since over time. And we see that, you, see, you can see this 
re these results reflected in some of the data. So this is an incidence rate, and like I said, it's impacted by a number of different things. Whether or not doctor catches it, whether or not it's diagnosed, whether or not the person comes into contact with these ticks. And what you see here is in 1990, this, these bars represent Lyme, these green ones and you've got this upward trend. So we don't think this is all due to the fact that the ticks have gotten worse, but in, it may be in part to a few, a variety of different factors. But the risk is really high here in Massachusetts. The adult black-legged tick, which is still active right around now, is about 40 to 50% infected with Lyme, which means one in two ticks. You think about flipping a coin, that's your chance of getting Lyme. But even if you were bit by 10 ticks, that's nearly 100% chance of getting Lyme here in Massachusetts. So those are the odds that you're looking at when it comes to infection rates of ticks. If you go to other parts of the country, like down south, their infection rates are not nearly as high, and same with California. One of the things that people like to always point out is the deer, right? So back in you know, 20, 30 years ago, the deer were not as much of a problem. There weren't too many of them. Ticks were not, deer ticks were not as much of a problem back 20, 30 years ago. And now we have deer and we have deer ticks. And so a lot of times people will say, well, the two must go hand in hand. One must have caused the other. There must be this correlation. And so deer, act as a very good reproductive host for deer ticks. So when the ticks go through three different stages, when they're a baby, it's called the larval stage, and they'll feed on some small mammals, things like mice, things like chipmunks and squirrels. Then the next stage, it's almost like a teenager stage, they again feed on mice and chipmunks and squirrels. Then when they are adults, this is the only time they're ever gonna feed on a deer, and that's the last meal that they'll ever eat. But they really tend to prefer deer at this particular point. But what's interesting about deer, is that they've tried eradicating deer or reducing deer in certain areas. And what they found is that it's only ever worked on islands and peninsula, it's never once worked in mainland areas. And in these particular studies where it's worked on islands and peninsula, they had to get the deer down to really, really low numbers, almost near eradication or completely eradicating the number of deer. In one particular study conducted on Monegan Island, this is an island where deer were purposely introduced and they had Lyme disease, they reduced deer Every, they killed every single deer with the exception of two deer, and they did not see any reduction in the number of Lyme cases or the number of ticks in that particular island. As soon as they got rid of those last two deer, then that population of ticks crashed, and to this day there really aren't too many ticks on Monhegan Island at all. So you're talking about this really intense deer culling. On areas where they try to reduce deer in mainland areas, they tried it in New Jersey and Connecticut, they might have reduced 50, around 50% 50 of the deer. They saw no reduction in the number of ticks, no reduction in the number of cases of Lyme. Um, so you're talking, uh, is this something financially feasible or is it socially acceptable to reduce these deer? Can you prevent immigration into this, in, of deer into these areas? They think there might be a minimum threshold with the number of deer, and this was taken from one of the studies done in Connecticut where you might have to reduce deer down to about 12 deer per square mile to see a noticeable impact. So to give you an idea, we might have 100 to 200 deer per square mile here, here in Massachusetts. And so you're, you're talking about a lot of, uh, a very high reduction. In one particular study where they, were in the, where they were trying to reduce the number of deer in Connecticut, they actually had hunters and animal rights activists on the same side because they had killed so many deer that the hunters could no longer find these deer. They were complaining, they said the deer were extinct, yet that was only 50% of the deer that were reduced. It wasn't down to this minimum threshold. Whenever they've gotten these down to the minimum threshold, they've had bait stations and residential properties, they've had perch snipers, aerial flyovers to track these deer migrations. And so it's a lot of work that goes into this. You can't, it's not just a matter of extending the hunting season. So overall targeting deer may be not too effective, maybe not great bang for your buck. But I'm, that's the best joke I have, guys, so <laughs> come on. <laughs> well, another interesting thing we see about, about ticks is that the risk tends to be higher in these suburban communities that border the water. So you, you, like right around here, you think like the southeast of Massachusetts. So Massachusetts, when you look at incidence rate, Massachusetts is usually about third in the nation for tick-borne disease. You know, you know, sometimes Maine is higher, sometimes Vermont's higher, those kind of go back and forth. Massachusetts is usually in the top 10, some usually around number three. Plymouth County is around number three in the state, and then you've got Nantucket and Dukes that are one and two. 
Barnstable County, number four. And so in all these areas, like I said, they're, they're kind of these areas that border the water, suburban communities. And we see this kind of, this, we see this trend in other states. If it's a suburban, this gradation, as you go from a rural community, it's lower, and then it gets higher in the suburban community, and then back down lower once you get into an urban community. So as you're developing this land, we see this peak right around these suburban, right when you get to that suburban area. And I don't think the ticks are after the Whole Foods or anything like that. So what we think is that it has to do with fragmented habitat, right? You take this forest here like this, where there might, not, there might be ticks here, but as you chop up this forest and you break it down and you create these nice homes that we all like to live in, there are, you might change the ratio of animals. There might be some animals that are more present in this area, and then you get fewer and fewer of them here, but there are some that stick around. So the animals that we think tend to go away are these large predators that predate on small animals. Things like uh, wolves or coyotes, things like uh, foxes and bobcats, those tend to be the animals where we see the largest decreases in population density. And the things that tend to stick around as you go from here to here are things like the mice or the chipmunks, robins, uh, squirrels, all these things tend to stick around. So they, they, as you go from here to here, the predators might be here, but there are fewer and fewer predators here versus, and then the small animals remain relatively the same. And that's really important after what we talked about. You know, what do the babies feed, what do the baby ticks feed on? Small animals. Chipmunks, shrews, voles, robins, viri, grackle. You know, and, th and that may re remain relatively the same here. As you go into these denser forests, you got a higher proportion of predators, reduce those numbers, maybe reduce the number of ticks. And we think that that's what's going on. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in this particular area, but it's our best guess at the moment. So there's this actually another reason why tick-borne diseases are increasing. And this has a lot to do with what are we are doing, human behavior. And so when I brought up that chart about what's going on in Plymouth County and what's going on in the other areas of Massachusetts, what's really interesting is that Barnstable County on the Cape used to be much higher than Plymouth County. But it's not anymore. Now Plymouth County's higher. And we think it has to do with the fact that people in Barnstable are just smarter. They have a robust education program where they're actually employing a lot of these things that I'm talking to you about right now. And lo and behold, they're not getting as many tick-borne diseases. It's actually working. That if you do the stuff to prevent tick-borne diseases, it can, in fact, work. And so the parameters in our, in our lives have changed. You know, like I said, you've got, back in the day, we didn't have as many deer. Maybe we didn't develop the land as much. Uh, now there are more ticks, higher infection rates, but we've, our behaviors have remained relatively the same. We still go out and expect to be able to go outside and not do anything, and then we get tick-borne disease. But there are tools that already exist that we can rely on. And like I said, I, I'm someone who really likes to go outside. I like to do a lot of outdoor activities. I like to hike, I like to fish, I like to camp, I like to bird, I like to butterfly watch. And even as part of my job, as one of the roles as the entomologist for Plymouth County, I'm actually on the lookout for new species of ticks. Maybe the, lo the longhorn tick that hasn't made it here. Lone star tick that we see on the Cape where we haven't seen an established population of ticks. So I'm going out into areas that I know I'm gonna find ticks. And like I said, I've never had a tick-borne disease. When I go out looking for ticks, I've never been bit by a tick. So you can go out there and, and have, I can't guarantee 100% protection, but very, very high levels of protection. So what, what is it about the biology of ticks? So one of the things to be aware of is that the risk of a tick bite is year-round. You can get bit by a tick even in the winter. The ticks have a two-year life cycle. They synthesize something in their blood called glycerol. That's antifreeze. So anytime the temperatures are above 32 degrees, you will have tick activity. In, under, they'll actually burrow underneath leaves and snow. They actually ran a study where they're like, how do ticks survive this beyond just this antifreeze? They'll actually burrow underneath leaves and snow and that will buffer them from these cold, deep freezes. So if you think that, oh, we had a cold, hard freeze, you know, or maybe in the fall, when we get into the fall, you get a co nice, cold, hard freeze, is that gonna noticeably impact the ticks? The answer is no. But the season matters when it comes to protecting yourself. 
Spring and fall is where we have nymphal activity. And this is actually where we, see, where we think of as maybe the most dangerous time, the most risky time of tick-borne disease. And then, because the nymphs are really small, they're about the size of a poppy seed. But what you, wanna, what you wanna think about is when school's out right now, you've got nymphs. And these nymphs are about two to three inches from the ground, so you wanna think ankle height. So school's out, now you wanna think the ticks are gonna be found any, anywhere below my ankles. And that's really important, is that ticks don't climb trees, they don't jump, they don't fly, they always crawl from the ground up. And these nymphs are gonna be found deep underneath leaf litter, or they might, if they're found higher up, it's gonna be a rock wall, where there's a lot of humidity, or there's gonna be a log, a pile of logs, where again, it's gonna be really damp. In the fall, when school's back in, you wanna think the adults are active. And these adults can be found up to two and a half feet off the ground, they're about the size of a poppy seed. So one of the reasons we think that the nymphs are the most dangerous is because they're so small, they may go undetected on your body for a longer period of time. And what we know about disease transmission is the longer a tick stays attached, the greater your chances of getting a tick-borne disease. But what's interesting about ticks is that one of their biggest weaknesses is that they, is that they dry out really, really fast. If I bring a tick indoors from the outside and I put it inside, it'll be dead in a matter of days. It cannot, it won't infest your home, it won't rapidly colonize your home, it's not like termites or bed bugs where they come into your home. You bring a tick inside and that tick is, is essentially dying. Once you get below 82% humidity, that tick is no longer able to capture humidity and is drying out very rapidly. Which means that in the area, when you look at away your yard, the areas that you're going to find ticks, it's not always just tall grass. It's any area that you think is going to harbor a lot of humidity. If you've got a lot of dense ground cover, Pachysandra, Japanese Barberry, a lot of maybe um, Virginia Creeper, that's going to be an area that, that's going to harbor a lot of moisture, be protected from the sun and wind, and you may encounter ticks there. The ticks won't actively migrate there. But if the ticks are picked up by an animal and then dropped off, now they're no longer drying out and so they're going to be able to stay there. Again, log piles, leaf piles, and then areas along the edges of your, your yard. Maybe not the center of your yard, you're not going to find ticks on the center of a soccer field, but you may find them on the edges of a soccer field. So you can keep ticks off your lawn, you know, this idea of a nice well-groomed American lawn. It looks nice, but it's also really safe when it comes to ticks. You're not going to find ticks I, would, I could be able to drag around here. I don't think I would find a single tick on this piece of property at all. They're not gonna be here. Again, if, you, if you've got a lot of children, maybe you wanna pull some of that equipment away from the yard so that every time they miss the soccer ball, they're not running out into the woods and crossing that barrier where we find, tend to find ticks. We find about 88% of ticks less than 10 feet from the forest edge. So again, like I said, the edges of forest. Now this is really significant because one of the things you can do to protect your yard, in addition to picking up leaves and raking and mowing your lawn, is you can conduct a perimeter yard spray. And there's a lot of different things, I know this can be really contentious, I, some, whenever I give this talk there's a lot of people out there that say, I want no chemicals, and then there's another group of people that say, well I'm going to do anything, no matter what it takes, I want to protect my family. And so I don't know what you guys want, but I'm just going to throw this out there as a tool. You can do it if you want, you don't have to do it. The, so, but if you do it, if you decide to do this, I want to give you the information on how you can do this the right way, where you're not just throwing your money away, flushing it down the toilet. You want to use a synthetic, and this is really important. If you're going to go down the road of like an all-natural spray, I wouldn't even bother doing a yard spray at all. The all-naturals really just have not caught up to where the synthetics are. Um, by Fenthrin or Talstar, this is kind of the gold standard when it comes to yard sprays. It doesn't have to be this but it's one of the more widely available ones. It's relatively cheap. You can't spray this yourself. You actually have to hire someone to spray it, but it should cost you about $100 a pop for about an acre of land. It might cost a little bit more or less depending on where you live and who you're paying. But it, it, if you think about it, that, that shouldn't be too much because you only really need to conduct two sprays per year. It's $200 a year. You think that's the cost of Netflix per year to have a yard that's almost completely tick free. Whenever they've conducted the spray two years and they've done it year after year, you get a close to 99 to 100% protection of ticks in your yard. So that's, that, I mean, the cost 200 bucks, almost a tick free yard. That's what you're looking at when it comes to this. When you want to spray is really important. You don't want to be spraying all throughout the entire year. We, we kind of miss the windows for these spring sprays. You can still conduct one now, but you're not gonna see that 99 to 100% protection until you do the spray next year. But if you wanted to do one, you would wanna do one now in June. 
But next year, you, in 2020, you want to start early mid-May, like around the first or second week of May, and then early mid-June. And the reason that's important is because this is when those nymph stage ticks are coming out. Remember I talked talk to you how they're about ankle height and below? And this is one of the reasons why the mosquito spray isn't as effective. Mosquito spray is usually this um, fine mist that they kind of float through the air. And also it's going to stick on barks of trees and brush. This is they're going to go and they're going to spray in the leaf litter along the perimeter and they're going to hit that area where the nymphs are going to be active. That less than 10 feet from the forest edge kind of mindset where you're going to spray into the leaves. And you target that generation of ticks, you target the nymphal stage and you essentially wipe out that generation. This synthetic spray lasts three to four weeks. So you think if you do this back to back, you get about eight weeks of solid protection where you're completely killing these nymphs. And that's why you do it. And that's why you don't need another spray after the, after the June spray. If you do a spray in July, we, like the nymphs, they, kinda, they, might, they go into almost like a dormancy at, during, during July. They're still active sometimes when it starts to get really hot and dry. And so they're not gonna be as active. You're gonna have a less, less of an effect on these, on these ticks. You can do an optional spray in late September. So that's when, the, that's when the adults become active. So if you decide to do this spray, if, you, if you're really interested in this, I would recommend doing one as soon as possible now, and then doing another one in September, and then doing the two back to back next spring. Um, but that, that's, that's pretty much the way you want to do it. And they, they want to spray this particular area in the woods, not, in the, not the center of your, your lawn. If you're curious about this product, if you're, you're nervous about it, it's the same class of compound they use to treat grubs. So if you're treat, already treating your lawn for grubs, it's not like you're overexposing your kids to this stuff or your family to this stuff. It's not if you're already treating for grubs. A lot of times people, they, they worry about the way their lawn looks, but we should also worry about keeping our lawn safe as well. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the all naturals. So this is taken from a study. You don't really need to see the text, but just focus on the, the height of the bars. The higher the bar, means that they found more ticks in this area. And so this is water. They found a lot of ticks when they sprayed water. These are two all natural sprays. No statistical significance from water. And so that's, that's why I say if you want to do something, if you want to do one of these sprays, you, you use the synthetic or you, I wouldn't use it at all. You're, you're kind of wasting your money. Same here, water. And these are the all naturals right here. Very, very similar to water. The one here, this right here, this is what I'm recommending. This is by Fenthern. They found zero ticks when they did this spray. They have these things called tick tubes. These are another thing that are marketed at controlling ticks in your yard. They target the white-footed mouse. Has anyone heard of these tubes? So these tubes, what I would, I would consider them maybe not a scam, but maybe some unreliable protection. So they don't always work. The, idea, the concept is that there's almost like this toilet paper roll, it's stuffed with cotton balls. This white-footed mouse takes these cotton balls, because they, they like cute and fluffy things, they like to cuddle stuff. And this mouse crawls into its burrow, cuddles on this, and it's a, it's a similar compound as what I'm recommending to you to spray in your yard. It's going to kill all the ticks on the mouse, doesn't hurt the mouse, the mouse climbs back out and grabs more cotton balls. In 1987, Dr. Tom Mather conducted this. He saw some pretty good results. But since then, Tom Daniels, 1981, Kirby Stafford, 1991, Kirby Stafford, 1992, they conducted the study in multiple, more areas, more states. Two years, each, each, each guy did this. They found no effect whatsoever. So I don't know what Tom did. I don't know why Kirby and, and, uh, and Tom Daniels and Kirby Stafford saw different results. Uh, but what I can tell you is that you're taking a gamble if you go to use these, these tubes. Maybe your yard is like Tom Mather, maybe it's not. Maybe it's more like, uh, like these other guys over here. So what we, what we think it has to do with is the fact that not all mice like to do this. Some mice like to do it, some don't. Maybe you only have one mouse on your property that likes to do this and takes all the cotton balls for himself. And what about all the other animals? What about robins don't do this? Chipmunks don't do this? Squirrels don't do this? Do you guys have chipmunks, squirrels, and robins? If you do, maybe these aren't really going to work. So that's it for yard protection. That that's pretty much sums up what you can do to protect just your yard. Now what can you do for yourself? So what about if you're someone like me who spends more time outside their yard than in their yard, how can you protect yourself? One of the first things people like to talk about is cover up. And this is the thing that I see that is reported most often is they usually talk about 
ticks are bad. All these diseases cause these horrible, horrible diseases. Horrible symptoms. And then at the bottom they'll just say like cover up and wear light colored clothing. Maybe they'll say use DEET. And then I'm like, there's more, there's more to the picture. There's more that you guys can do. But covering up is one important aspect because that will delay a bite. One of the things you can do in addition to just covering up, just wearing clothes like this, is you can tuck your pants into your socks. And uh, I do this, and it looks really nerdy, but I've been a nerd my entire life, so I have no problem looking like this. But what, you, what it does is you've got this nice gap between your ankle and, your, and the pants, and the ticks they take, may take 30, to two hour, 30 minutes to two hours to bite. So a tick is not necessarily going to bite this spot. You know when a mosquito lands on you, they almost always bite right away right at that spot? Ticks search, and they search and search and search, and they move very slowly. And they look for just the right spot that they want to bite. And so this tick might crawl all the way up. It might crawl all the way to places that only your doctor should have access to. And the last thing that I think any of you want is for that to happen. But if you tuck your pants into your socks, what that does is that almost creates this like Ziploc baggie around that whole bottom half of your body. And like I said, you know, nymphs, nymphs are found ankle height. Adults might be found about knee or waist height. And this, that means this whole area of your body is now blocked from any ticks accessing any part of your skin. And so that's, I mean, like I said, it looks nerdy, but it, it's very, very effective. But covering up only gets you so far. No one wants to walk through the woods and end up like this. And when I go out and I go, sur I go surveilling for ticks, I go dragging my cloth through ticks, my cloth will look a lot like this. But I won't have any ticks on my body. And the reason behind that is that I use this stuff called permethrin. And a lot of people, they might not know about this, but this stuff has existed since the 80s. This stuff will repel ticks, and it also kills ticks. And there's nothing else we have. DEET won't do this, OFF won't do this, citronella candles won't do this. This is the only thing you can spray on your clothing, you can't spray it on your skin, it's clothing only, that will, that will effectively kill any ticks that touch your body. So how do you use it? Well, you apply it to clothing and shoes only. You can apply it to more than just clothing and shoes. I do a lot of backpacking, so I spray my backpack. What you want to think of is anything that touches the ground or goes below your waist that you're going to set on the ground, a blanket, gardening gloves. If you spend a lot of time kneeling, you might want to spray further up on your body. But uh, you can't really spray your skin. It's not going to kill you if it hits your skin. It's just not going to work properly. This stuff needs to bind very tightly to fabrics, uh, materials. You can spray it on waterproof boots. Um, you can spray it on like nylon and synthetics. It'll bind to that. It's just not going to bind very tightly to skin. Wait for it to dry. On a day like this, it might take less than two hours. But what I essentially do is I spray my clothes and I just go and I actually leave my clothes out overnight and then I pick them up in the morning and I know that they're dry by then. Because this stuff lasts a really long time. Six washings are one month. So this isn't something that you would spray uh, right before you go out. This is something that you might get in the habit of treating your clothes every month. And that's what I do. I do first week of every month, I treat my clothes. And, and, it lasts a re and that's because it lasts for so long. So what, the way you want to think about ticks is what can I do beforehand? Then you go and you pretty much enjoy yourself during your activities. And then what can you do afterward? You don't necessarily need to be thinking about ticks while you're out having fun. Is this stuff safe? Safe for infants, toddlers, and children? Safe for pregnant and nursing mothers? But you want to keep cats away until it's dry. Is anyone here a cat person? I'm a cat person. I love my cat. I love my cat even more than my fiance. And so the, the big thing about this, uh, this product is that it mimics a plant toxin, and cats have lost their ability to break down plant toxins. And so if you've ever had a cat get into things like lilies, or if they've gotten into chrysanthemums, they start to vomit, they get really sick. And so this product, this permethrin, it mimics something found in, per, in, in uh, chrysanthemums. So it's going to have an impact on cats. But if you wait for it to dry, then the cats are OK. And I've spoken with veterinarians on this topic. They say the same thing. If you wait for it to dry, then you're OK. And uh, my cat's sitting on my pants. Uh, these clothes are actually the clothes that I would use to do surveillance. And that's why I wanted people to see them, is that it doesn't stain. It doesn't have any smell. It doesn't leave this oily residue. And your cats are OK once it's dry. Yes? Do you have a question? OK. Um, 
So what about skin? So the permethrin is really good for clothing, but you know, people want to wear shorts in the summer, they want to wear sandals. You can use repellents, and these don't, won't kill a tick on contact. They're not like permethrin, they don't work as well. Um, but they work by repelling ticks. They work by basically blinding the tick to, to being able to detect you. This tick, this is a deer tick, this tick is, effect, is blind. She can't see you. The way that she's gonna detect you is she's gonna smell you with her howler's organs. These are like tick noses. They're on the end of each of her legs. And they're gonna detect things like CO2. As you, as you breathe, she can smell the level of CO2 changing in the air around her. She can smell things like lactic acid in our sweat, body odors. She can actually smell with her howler's organs body heat. And when you wear one of these repellents, what that does is that jams up these receptors. It makes it so that they don't function properly. She can't necessarily detect you at this point. And so it's almost like putting on a cloaking device, like an invisibility cloak or um, uh, something that, that would blind this tick. But you want to focus on the EPA register repellents, and they're going to have this EPA registration number. And the reason behind this is because if it's got an EPA registration number, that means it's been tested for safety and efficacy. If it doesn't have this number, it has not been tested at all. They could be selling you essentially water, and they wouldn't be held accountable. There's, no, there's nothing that they would be doing wrong. And, but this, with this registration number, you know that you have that. DEET, picaridin, and IR3535. These are all things you want to look at. When it says active ingredient here, that's what you want to look for. But you only need 20% or more. A lot of times people don't want to know, they don't know what to use. 100% is not five times better than 20%. You get the same level of repellency, whether it's 20%, 30%, or 100%. That 100% may last a little bit longer. But if you're really worried about overexposing yourself to any of these things, you want to use, the, you just need 20% or more. That's it. You don't have to use DEET. These two at the bottom work exactly the same. If you don't know what IR353535 is, it is Avon Skin So Soft with Bug Guard. So if you know an Avon representative, you can get that. But it has to say with Bug Guard, it can't just be the regular Avon Skin So Soft. This Picaridin, I really like. It doesn't have a smell like DEET. So it's, it's something that's really nice if people don't really like that heavy, odor that DEET has. Uh, you also have oil of lemon eucalyptus in this thing, Bio-UD. Um, there's a question on whether or not they work as well on deer ticks. So these, even though e they are EPA registered and the CDC does recommend them, the studies that they have conducted on these have never been field studies with deer ticks. There's one, like this one down here was done on a filter paper, where your skin is very different from filter paper, what goes on in the environment is very different. And this one, oil of lemon eucalyptus, was used on a different species of tick, not the, not the deer tick that we find around here. And so, they have shown a really high efficacy on mosquitoes and like dog ticks and lone star ticks, but do they work the same on deer ticks? Probably, but I, I can't say that for sure. Uh, what about protection for pets? Well, pets can get tick-borne diseases, right? We want to protect our pets against that. But pets also do something interesting, whereas they, they love to do things like this, and then they also like to do things like this, right? And so in this particular regard, ticks, uh, pets can act maybe a little bit like a Trojan horse at this point, where a tick may not necessarily bite this animal. The tick might get caught up in the hairs, or it might lay down and think that you're more tasty than the pet is. And that can happen. So a, a pet can bring a tick into our house, and, they can act, and they can, there can be a rote of exposure. So even if you're doing every, everything you, you need to, you do the perimeter yard spray, you protect your clothing, now your dog runs over that perimeter into the woods, picks up a tick, runs back in, and then you're sitting in your pajamas which are not protected by permethrin, and their dog lays down in your lap, and now you have a potential risk of getting bit by a tick at that point. But if you protect your pets, that's another avenue that you can eliminate. So there's no blanket. There's not really a, like with humans and with yards, you can give these blanket approaches. With pets, basically you just want to listen to your vet. So they're going to recommend a variety of different products. They can be anything from a collar that you put on your pet to topical treatments that you treat your pet with every month. But when you, when you, when you use these, you want to follow exactly the, what the directions say and what your vet says. So this particular product, even though this looks very similar to this, they've got similar uh, labeling here, they're made by the same company. I mean, this is a cat, this even looks like a cat. You still cannot put this on a cat. You could cause some serious, serious harm if you were to do this. And this has happened because this product here 
is cheaper than this one. Sometimes people think, oh, I can save a few bucks. They're both the same size. I mean, what harm could it really do? They're formulated different. They use different chemicals. And this can cause some serious, serious damage to this cat. You can also vaccinate your dogs against Lyme. That's another thing you can do. And while that won't protect against things like canine babesiosis, you can uh, you protect them against Lyme, which is a more common disease. But no protection methods 100%. There have been some studies where they got a, close to 100% protection. Some people wearing permethrin, for instance, got 100% protection with that. Some pe people doing a yard spray got 100% reduction in the number of ticks. But that's not going to happen every single time, and I can't put that guarantee on this because everything's different. So your tick checks work a little bit like your safety net. In this study that was conducted in 1995, 9 out of 10 people did not find and remove a nymph in less than 24 hours. Again, that's why we think this time of year might be the most dangerous. If you think over, like at 90% did not find this tick, and this tick has stayed attached to them for that long period of time, means there's a high risk that these people might have contracted a tick-borne disease. And then after five days, 60 hours is five days, 13% of the people still did not find that tick on their body after that long. Some of these people tell me, they'll say, Blake, I had a tick, on, I, you know, I have Lyme disease and I never even noticed a tick. Well, at five days, that's about as long as that tick's ever going to feed. That tick might drop off in that time frame. 13% of those people did not find that tick. That can happen. And so it's really important that you do these tick checks. Pretty, much, I recommend whenever you come in. Whenever you're coming in from doing work on the outside, a good time to do it is in the shower or when you go to the bathroom. There's this concept of this 24-hour rule that I want to talk a little bit about. So tick-borne diseases, the transmission is not like Cinderella where you get it at the stroke of midnight after 24 hours. Some people will say if you pull off a tick in less than 24 hours, well then you're safe. But that's not necessarily true because the, this 24-hour rule comes from animal models. It doesn't come from people. It comes from studies that were conducted in animals, usually mice. And the intervals that they use are very widely spaced. So they'll run a study, they'll take infected ticks, put them on uninfected mice, and they'll check them at 12 hours and none of those mice will have any tick-borne diseases. And then they'll check them at 24 hours, and then maybe 6% of those mice now have Lyme disease. And so then this is where that 24-hour rule comes from. And then, then they, there's like, well, if it's less than 24 hours, then you're safe. But we don't know if those mice got that disease at 12 hours in one minute. We, we don't know. And so one of the things, like, like I said, is you just do your tick checks as frequent as possible. When you come inside, then you don't need to worry about this stuff. And then there's also this 24-hour rule. It doesn't talk about things like Poisson virus or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, where their transmission times are shorter than, than Lyme disease, babesiosis, and, and anaposmosis. So it's all about how ticks kind of make us sick. So ticks are not a syringe. The reason why there's this concept of a 24-hour rule is that ticks take a very long time to feed. They're going to attach to your body, and they're not looking to crenulate a vein like a mosquito would. They actually want to create this thing called a feeding lesion, which is a wound under our skin. And they're going to inject a lot of different pharmacologically active compounds, things that are going to promote blood flow to the site, prevent clotting, suppress our immune systems, reduce the pain we feel. And in order to do that, they actually need to do something really disgusting. And I hate to say this before lunch, but uh, they're going to actually spit into your body. And it's that spitting action. And they're going to do this repeatedly over and over again. They're going to suck and then they're going to spit. That's how you get these diseases. The diseases reside in the midgut right here, these red part of the tick, and in the blue parts, the salivary glands. And so, it, it's so, and that's really important is that it's the spitting action that we know takes hours for that to occur, and the, also in the, in the gut of the tick. So again, if you don't like when someone spits into your drink, you really don't want a tick spitting into your body. Um, so what do you do if you find a tick? Well, step one, you don't panic. You just want to pull it off properly. Pair of tweezers, simplest, they're the simplest. Some of these tick removal tools also work. You want to grasp it on close to the skin as possible. You want to grab this part here, that's called the scutum, it's really hard. And you just pull straight up with steady force. Don't use matches, gasoline, nail polish remover. Those things we don't know, but they could possibly enhance disease transmission because they might cause that tick to spit. So once again, it's that spitting action. That's what we want to prevent. After you remove the tick, you want to bag it and then you want to date it. And by date it, you want to write the date on the bag. 
And the reason you want to do this is because uh, a lot, I know a lot of people, they just want to get rid of the tick. They flush it down the toilet, they crush it, they burn it. But if you save the tick and you write the date, this can give you a lot of information post tick bite about what's going on in your life. If you start to experiencing symptoms, uh, maybe a month after that tick bite, then, then you might be able to relate that back to the tick. And having that date's important. And instead of going to your doctor, if you went to your doctor and you said, oh, I was bit by a tick. Oh, I think it was Memorial Day. Maybe it was before, I can't remember. That doesn't really tell the doctor too much information. But by having that date, you can now trace that tick bite back to the exact time that that happened. And now you know that the symptoms are happening X amount of time afterward. You want to save the tick in a bag because you can get that tick identified. And identification and knowing the species, again, is really important to piecing together part of the story and knowing what your overall risk of a tick-borne disease is. This tick, the deer tick, transmits five diseases. That's it. So even though we're at risk for 10 different ones here in Plymouth County, you can only get five from the deer tick. You can get two from the American dog tick, and then you can get five, including these two, from the Lone Star Tick. And we haven't really seen Lone Star Tick here in Plymouth County too much. So when you're really looking at it, you're looking at these two diseases and then these five, that's what you're at risk for in Plymouth County. But if you save the tick, like if you, save, if you were bit by this tick and you saved it in the bag, now you know you're only on the lookout for these two diseases. And these two diseases have specific symptoms and specific characteristics. Now you don't have to worry about these diseases. And so having that, if you just, were bit by a tick and you don't know what a tick it was, then now you're looking at all 10. You don't know. And you can, if you don't know what the ticks look like, you can have this identified online. There's a, there's a website called Tick Spotters run through University of Rhode Island. They'll do it for free. I can do it for you as well, and I'll do it for free. Um, you can also get that tick tested. And this, tick, this testing is not to be used for a medical diagnosis. You can't go and diagnose yourself with it because there's a lot of reasons why being bit by a tick wouldn't be necessarily guarantee whether or not you got that disease. But what this can tell you is what you might have been at risk for. And this can give your doctor more information with how they might want to proceed. So in this particular tick right here, you don't need to see the text, but this was positive for Lyme disease and it was positive for babesiosis. And what's really significant about this is that this woman could have gotten both of these diseases and they're typically treated differently. This one's usually treated with something like doxycycline and this one might be treated with something like azithromycin. And so, and at her age, at this woman, she's 79, at her age, an untreated case of babesiosis could be fatal. And what's really interesting is that a doctor may or may not be aware that babesiosis exists because that exists, it's not as prevalent in certain areas of Massachusetts. It's prevalent in, in, uh, on, in Plymouth but if you go further west, it might not be as prevalent. They might not be aware of it. And if the tick comes back negative, that's also some really good information because now you know that this tick wasn't carrying any tick-borne disease. Now, there might be another tick on your body somewhere else. So if you still start feeling symptoms, you still want to see your primary care physician. But knowing that this, if you're not feeling any symptoms and now this tick is negative, well, that could be some peace of mind right there. And the last thing I would recommend is that you take a picture of the bite. You take a selfie. And this is not to brag to your friends on Facebook, on social media. This is because the, the bite of a tick, the rash that is left behind, can look very different to certain people. And, and having an image to show your doctor can, again, be an important tool to help them diagnose what's going on. This is the bullseye rash that we see with Lyme disease. That Everyone talks about the bullseye rash that grows. This will expand and usually grow to be about 8 inches in diameter. And it, and, but this right here, this is also the bullseye rash, even though it doesn't look anything like a bullseye. And this, again, will expand to be about 8 inches in diameter. It doesn't always occur at the site of the bite. Uh, but if you take a picture of the bite and you track it over time and you show your doctor this, they, they, will be more familiar, they might be more familiar with saying, okay, that's a bullseye rash, even though it doesn't look like a bullseye. Or, you know, if it looks like this, and you bring it to the doctor, and your doctor says, no, that's not a bullseye rash, now you have that data to bring to another doctor for a second opinion. And so, but if you don't have any pictures, and pictures are free, everyone has a camera on their phone nowadays, you can, you can you now have that hard evidence to bring with you from doctor to doctor, or even just to your first doctor if they're, if they're really good. And so the bottom line is if we aren't protecting ourselves, who will, right? So 
these diseases have increased so much in the past, you know, 15, 20 years. But if we actually put some of these things into pra practice, we can effectively protect ourselves. You know, with the right information and tools, all tick-borne diseases are preventable. Um, and at this point, I'll take any questions. Or if you guys just want to head to lunch, too, that's also good. <laughs> I do have a question. I haven't developed or worked on any kind of birth control for ticks. So that would be a really challenging undertaking. Um, one of the thing, one of the, I guess you could consider uh, deer eradication a, a form of birth control, because the deer they like to feed, they need to feed on the deer in order to reproduce, and so if you wipe away their food that they need to eat in order to reproduce, then that would be birth control. But just impacting tick egg laying and fertilizing ticks. Uh, female black-legged tick will lay about 2,000 eggs. And so you think there are, there are tons and tons of ticks out there. And so how would you implement that? I mean, would it be easier just to spray something that would kill them rather than sterilizing them? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it would. And th that's kind of the approach that we've taken is, is usually just flat out killing them or impacting one of their hosts. So we try to impact either the host that they want to feed on when they're babies or the ones that we want to feed, they want to feed on when they're adults. And so that deer eradication, the tick tubes are targeted at the, the, when they're feeding when they're young. The deer eradication is targeting when they're feeding when they're an adult. The acaricide spray is just trying to kill them. Any other questions? Yeah. What would you call the having a yard spray? So I can talk to you about that afterward. I, can't, I don't want to recommend any particular people. Um, but really, what you want to do is if you call up any, any pesticide applicator, what's really important is it's your yard. You should know what they're spraying, right? right? Ask them what they're spraying. What's really important is that they're spraying either the bifenthrin or the Talstar. There's a few other ones. If it ends in methrin, then you're probably on the right route. So there's cypermethrin, deltamethrin. Those will also have a really high impact on ticks as well. Uh, and so they can, if they're, if they're like, I'm not spraying bifenthrin, but I'm spraying deltamethrin, that's OK. That's also going to work. Um, and then you can just shop around for the cheapest guy if you want it. Or you want them to spray in the right areas too. So I would ask them again, how are you going to spray this? If they're like, I'm going to just spray the perimeter, and I'm going to spray with this product, then OK, then that's some good advice right there. That, that, that would be someone that I would, I would Maybe I would trust them on uh, that. Yep. How about squirrels or birds carrying them into trees? So t yeah, so ticks are never going to climb a tree on their own, but it is feasibly possible that a squirrel or a bird would climb it on, would would bring it up into a tree. What's interesting, what a lot of people don't understand as much about ticks, is that ticks when they latch on to feed. They're pretty much feeding there for good. So they'll feed for about four to five days as their larval and nymph stage, and a week for an adult. So if you see like a deer running through your yard, the ticks aren't popping off that deer. They tend to feed until they're full, and then when the animal goes to lay down, they'll drop off. So if it's feeding on a squirrel, and what you're asking right now, it's not, the squirrel's not going to be, it's not going to be bringing it up and you know, see, see squirrels jumping from branch to branch. They're not falling off the squirrel at that point. If the squirrel lays down inside the tree or somewhere, the tick may fall off into, into where, the, the little hole that it lays down in or, or something like that. It could feasibly lay down there. Now the tick doesn't have the machinery to then jump out of the tree, so the tick would be stuck in that hole. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. What could happen, I know, I know a lot of people say, well, a, a tick might have fallen out of a tree. It could, it, it's possible it might be a bird's nest, and then the tick climbed out of the bird's nest. But then you'd have to be thinking like that I'd have to be standing under the bird's nest at the exact time that that tick decided to come out of that bird's nest. And that, that tick is not going to live very long in a bird's nest. You're, you're talking about a matter of days. So it's possible, not very likely. How about the nymphs? Are you a lot of Little red nymphs that fall down off the trees sometimes. Red? They're, they're red. They wouldn't be red. So they, they might be mites. The mites probably. Yeah, it might be mites. There's a, there's a few things that look like ticks. That uh, spider beetles look a lot like ticks. Uh, mites can look a lot like ticks. And those things could would definitely be up in trees. They're so not necessarily a tick. Every time. Yeah, they can be. They like a spider beetle almost looks exactly like a tick. It even looks like it has eight legs like a tick. It look it's um because it, it's an, the antenna are about the same length as the legs, and so it looks like it has the eight legs. 
So it's, it's you know, it could be one of those things. How about if you yep. have, find a spot on your body and you don't know how long it's been there, is there a time frame that taking a certain medicine is going to help you or not? That's, that's kind of a medically qualified, that's a, that's a question that would require um, basically a doctor or someone, someone to answer. What I, get, what I think you're asking and what I can tell you is that there was a study conducted on whether or not taking 200 milligrams of doxycycline uh, right after a tick bite, if that helped. And in that particular, that one particular study, taking that doxycycline right after a tick bite did seem to reduce the onset of Lyme. Um, but it wasn't 100% in all cases, and it was um, just one single study. And everybody that gets that big red spot does have Lyme? So that, that's why I recommend taking a picture, is because when I said, when the tick bites, you know, I told you it does that really gross thing where it spits in your body. That can cause an actual localized reaction sometimes, especially when you pull off that tick. If you think that tick is, it create that wound, created that wound, and now it's suppressing your immune system. It's knocking out your, your pain reducers, promoting blood flow. You pull off that tick, sometimes your body reacts to it and tries to heal and you get that inflammation right there. Not necessarily the bullseye rash. It can be a really large red mark. But it, the, the erythema migraines, that bullseye rash, it, you want to take a, it looks different. It tends to radiate outward. It usually grows to about eight inches in diameter over the course of several weeks. It doesn't show up necessarily right away. It's usually like seven to ten days after the tick bite. And so it's a little bit different than just that immediate reaction after the tick bite. But if you take a picture, a doctor is going to be able to tell apart both of them pretty easily. And so that's why it's, it's a good idea instead of, I mean, you can go online and try to memorize it and figure it out. There's pictures on the CDC that you can look at, but um, a doctor is going to be a much better bet, a much safer bet, and that's what I would recommend. Are all doctors uh, aware of this now? Or I shouldn't say all, but most. So the thing with doctors is that uh, the, the doctors are, are, are definitely, like it's not us against doctors, it's the doctors are honestly trying to help you out. And doctors, at least the ones that I've spoken with, are aware of Lyme, Babesiosis, and Anaplasmosis. They're not necessarily aware of the seven others that you can contract. Um, they should relatively, it's, what's really funky is that they don't always run what they call a tick panel, which is the testing for these tick-borne diseases, and I don't know why, which is why I have that tick testing. Because if you walked into your doctor and your doctor said, oh, I I'm going to test you just for Lyme, and you said, no, wait a second, doc, this tick was also carrying X, Y, and Z. Can you test me for those things? That's basically your argument to say, like, well, you know, like maybe I may be exposed. And they might say, like, well, it doesn't guarantee that you have this, but at least you now have that that, inf that evidence to argue your case. And how is the test done? So with, with that brochure, they'll basically show you on the back. Okay. It, it does cost money, which stinks. Um, I wish it didn't. It costs about $50 a pop. But it, um, it's, the, it's the best lab I recommend. Some will do it for free, but it's one of those things you get what you pay for. The free stuff, I wouldn't trust at all. Um, this particular, this is UMass Amherst, and they run, their methods are peer-reviewed, they're published, they're out for everyone to see, so if anyone can criticize it, it shows exactly what they do. So you, and unlike some other labs, where you don't know what they're doing in those labs, you don't know if they're just giving you bogus information. Um, in this particular um, testing site, they'll get it back to you in three business days. So it's, it's quick, it's accurate, um, their methods are pretty much out in the open for people to see, and that's why I recommend it. Um, additionally, um, they use it for surveillance, and they have a central database, so it's a, another good reason to test for them if you care about like improving the, the knowledge we have of tick-borne diseases. It's another good reason to test for them. I know I'm asking a lot of questions. No, no, that's okay. Um, how long after you've been bitten would be, the test didn't be valid? Uh, anytime. So even if you've been bitten, you can test that tick like several months after. It, it, uh, you can wait. So that's what some people do. They wait, they, and then if they start feeling sick, then they'll send that tick in to get it tested. Um, some people test it right away. Uh, it, it's, it, that would be a personal decision, but you can wait on that. Okay. Thank you.
Have you ever been bitten by a tick? Once as a kid, I was bit by a dog tick. Um, but since I've been doing these things, never, never been bit by a tick. So, uh, like I said, I'm wearing these true shoes are treated with the permethrin. Um, socks are treated. Pants are treated. I tuck my pants into my sock. I can walk through virtually anywhere in Massachusetts and not get ticks on my body. That, that's that's just how well that stuff works. Uh, my best friend, when I got this job, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but my best friend got Lyme disease about a week after I got this job. And I said, man, you're going to get me fired. Like, if I, can't, if I can't convince my best friend to do this stuff, how can I convince other people? And so I got in my car. I had a little vial of ticks that I brought with me. Drove over. Took a pair of shoes. It was a different pair of shoes than this. Um, dropped the tick on the shoe, and the tick died. And he said, I can't believe the tick died. I said, I told you this stuff. That <laughs> but it wasn't until he saw that that it really clicked. And now he wears the stuff all the time. We go hiking together. He doesn't get tick-borne disease. Um, they've got a dog. They've got a nice yard. They live in uh, Pembroke. And they don't get ticks. The dog doesn't come in with ticks. They get their yard sprayed twice a year, like I said. Um, they go hiking. They, they don't get ticks on their body. Um, the stuff, the, the stuff works. The, the, the tools that I give you, they do work. You it, sell the stuff? No, I don't sell anything. Um, that, it's really important that I don't sell anything. Because when I, my particular role, the way I see it, is I'm here to give you unbiased information. That's it. Whether or not you follow that, that's your call. But the point is that just that you have these tools. I mean, the yard spray, for instance, I don't do the yard spray because um, I'm cheap. And I use, I, use the, I use the personal protection. I'm outside my yard more than I'm in my yard. So you know, why would I want to protect my yard? I don't have little kids that run around in my yard. It's just me. Um, so I don't do the yard spray. You don't have to. Some people, some people have a lot of kids running run in the yard. The yard spray would be really good um, bang for your buck if you had a lot of kids running around in your yard. Now, where do you buy that stuff that you put all over your clothes? Um, Walmart, Dick's Target. Um, you can get through Amazon online, um, Target online. I, I don't. No, I have it on the card. I have, um, I have it on the card. The other thing you can do, I know a lot of people, uh, they don't have that much time on their hand, or maybe they're not some Thanks. people who like a lot of routine. I like a lot of routine. You can send your clothes away and get the clothes treated with that stuff and it lasts for 80 washings. So it lasts a really, really long time. It's called Insect Shield. Um, and like I said, I don't want to push brands, but they're the only company that does this. So that would be the only way you could do it. Um, but you just go online, insectshield.com. You can buy their clothing, or you can send away your own clothing. I know a woman who, she, tr she sends all her kids' clothing away, and her kids don't even know they're treated and just pull clothes out of the drawer and wear them. And she knows that the kids are going to be safe when they're going out and playing. You can always email me or call me. Question. I had